I'm hoping you're still with me out there, okay? So we're going to break this down and think about, well, what is true faith? Because I believe that the essence of this passage is that Jesus is explaining what true faith really looks like, okay? True biblical faith is coming to Jesus himself alone. It's not looking at God for God. What can you do for me? Some people have this idea that the Christian faith is kind of like, God is kind of like a vending machine in the sky. God, I'll put in this much. I'll go to church. Okay, I'll pray. I'll go to youth group. I'll stop doing this action that I know is sinful. And I'll do this. And then God, you will give me this kind of life that I want to live. It's almost like God is some sort of heavenly vending machine. We put our quarter in and then we expect out of that blessings, temporal blessings. And Jesus is saying, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. You're looking at the temporal bread. And I want to give you so much more. The pastor and writer John Piper He wrote a book called Desiring God. Some of you may have read it. I highly recommend it. But John Piper, his big um, desire almost in life is to bring our culture into the knowledge of Jesus and his glory. And he uses Jonathan Edwards, the old Puritan's theology in, in many of his books. And he talks about this idea of Christian hedonism. Kind of sounds strange, doesn't it? A hedonist is one who seeks pleasure. And he says that ultimately, uh, Christians are to find their ultimate pleasure in God alone. And he says that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. And what he's getting at is he's saying that our chief end as Christians should be to enjoy the worship of our God, to be filled with Him, to be filled with His glory, and to know Him, and to be satisfied in Him. And so... This is really what true faith is all about. It's, it's ultimately coming to the Lord Jesus. And it's saying, Lord Jesus, you fill me. You fill me with yourself. And so, as we look at this passage, we're going to look at this first, what true faith is. And, and that is, number one, true faith checks motives. True faith checks motives. What I mean is, It's looking to Christ alone versus the benefits he gives. So in this story, Jesus had just done this amazing miracle. He had fed the 5,000. It was probably more like 15,000 or more. Because the biblical writers only say, this is how many men were there, 5,000. But think about, they probably had their families, there was children. There could have been 15 or 20,000. I mean, people were following Jesus because he was doing signs. And it was almost like he was the like you 2 or some rock star going around Galilee, people were following after him in hordes. The crowds were coming after him. And so uh, the next day, that evening, there was, I didn't read this passage, but he had walked on the water out to meet the disciples. So he left that area where the crowds had seen him give the bread. And now they're just frantically looking for him. They can't find him. And finally they discover, well, he's not here. Let's go over to Capernaum. And they find him there. And the first thing... Jesus says, they, well, he, they ask in 25, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus goes right to the heart of their motives. In verse 26, he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And then he says this, Do not labor for food that perishes, but for, for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus is getting at the heart of the issue. The crowds are following him for the temporal, for instant gratification, for immediate physical blessings. Jesus, we're hungry. Jesus, you're a meal ticket. And Jesus is saying something else. He's saying, I'm going to give you myself. You see, Jesus is offering filet mignon. And they're looking for hot pockets. Okay, Jesus is offering... Crab cakes, I love crab cakes. Steak, sirloin, okay? And they want to go to McDonald's. Jesus is saying, the Son of God is here. He says, 
In fact, he says this. He says, uh, you saw the signs. You saw the signs. And what signs mean in the book of John is they were a testimony, not just some some fantastic miracles he was doing, but the signs, the miracles were pointing to the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, God himself is here. The signs, these miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 was not to just say, wow, Jesus has given out bread. Let's follow him and we'll be fed forever. We'll have all our needs met. He's saying, no, these signs are saying, no, I am God. I am here, the Messiah. The one long awaited for is here, is in your presence. Worship me. This is amazing. And they're saying, let's just have another piece of bread. Let's just get what we can get today. You see, Jesus is going after motives here. And he's saying, run to me. Be fed with me and who I am. They have the right object, but they're overwhelmed with what they want. The temporal fix of hunger. So the question is, for you and I, do you see that in your own life? Why, do you, why are you here this morning? I ask my students, like, why do you come to RUF? You know, is it, are you just here because you're, you're thinking that like, okay, if I come, then God will give me that job. God will get me into that major. God will get me that GPA that I really need so I can get that job and have the American dream. Like, so I'm going to do these, these religious things. You see, that's getting it all wrong. That's bargaining with God. That's saying, God, if I do this, then you'll give me that. That's the vending machine mentality. Tim Keller, the pastor of Redeemer in New York, writes this. Uh, on one hand, you may feel that you need God, even though you may recognize that you have needs only God can meet. But he says this, you must not try to use him to achieve your own ends. It is not possible to bargain with God. I'll do this if you do that. That is not Christianity at all, but a form of magic or paganism in which you appease the cranky deity in exchange for a favor. And he asks this question, are you getting into Christianity to serve God or to get God to serve you? Those are two opposite motives. And they re result in two different religions. You must come to God because one, you owe it to him to give him your life because he's your creator, he's your God. And two, you're deeply grateful to him for sacrificing his son because he's your redeemer. So whether or not the Lord gives you that life that you want, that doesn't really matter. We worship him because of who he is. He is God. He is the Almighty. He created us. He created this amazing world. I actually parked my car down over there, and then instead of walking up the parking lot, I decided to walk along the little path. You guys ever do that? And just enjoyed for a few moments before coming in here the glory of God's creation. There's a, there's a little uh, you know, walkway over the water there. It's beautiful. The leaves are changing. The season's this is the God who has made us. This is the God who's created us. Are you in it for what you can get out of God? Or is it because of who He is? That's the question of motives that you have to ask yourself. The second thing is true faith looks more like a 24-hour food bar than a one-time meal. Okay, second point is this. That true faith is continued dependence on Jesus. Many people look at the Christian life as some sort of insurance policy. Okay, I was a youth minister in Oklahoma, more in the, what we call the Bible Belt of the youth, of the, uh, of the U.S., where basically everybody goes to church. Not everybody, but a lot, a lot more in that culture go to church. It's kind of part of the fabric. But the question is, do they truly love Jesus? Do you truly love Jesus? And a lot of people think about, um, well, they're a Christian because they prayed to receive Christ when they were a little kid. Uh, or they walked an aisle, or they signed something, or they raised their hand. But then... They, and so they talk about that, but their life right now really doesn't look anything like a Christian. 
And they, they think about, well, I'm a Christian because way back then I did this. But what Jesus is saying here in the, is that the gospel is not just this one-time event. It is, yes, you came to that realization that you're a sinner and you needed Christ and you, you saw that you were a sinner, you confessed your sins, you said, I need Jesus and what you did on the cross for me. Yes, that's the big meal. But he's saying that the Christian life, what authentic faith is, what that true faith is, is really a dependence upon him all the time. It's more like, like I said, like a 24-hour food bar. And so all through this passage, Jesus is using that metaphor of bread. He did the miracle of the bread. And now he's using that physical miracle, that illustration, so to speak, to say that this is who I am. I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. So he continually says things like 32. My father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. I think they were still just thinking about physical bread. And then in 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then later on, 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. How many times did you all eat today? Maybe some had breakfast. Maybe, maybe if you think about your life, Maybe you've eaten like three or four times. You, you know, you've snacked, you've grazed on maybe like a donut and you've had some coffee and, you know, you've been nibbling on things here and there, you know, kind of great. Just think about your life. How many times do you actually put something in your mouth? I bet you it's more than three meals a day. Okay. And if you know anything about the Lord of the Rings, okay, Jesus wants hobbits. Okay. The hobbits were those little creatures Okay, they were eating all the time. In fact, I was reading about uh, the meals that a hobbit eats during the day. Okay, if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. 7 a.m. breakfast. 9 a.m. second breakfast. 11 o'clock, 11 z's. 1 p.m. luncheon. 4 p.m. afternoon tea. Uh, 6 p.m. dinner. 8 p.m. supper. And a lot of times they had a seventh meal. They, they tried to eat all the time. I mean, in fact, there's a quote here. In the beginning of the book, it says about the hobbits, and laugh they did, and eat and drink, and heartily, being fond of simple jests at all times, and of six meals a day when they could get them. What Jesus is saying in this passage is, it's not a, the, the evidence of true faith is not just a one-time meal. The evidence of true faith is you understand that you are needy. You understand that you are a sinner. And until Jesus comes again, or until you go and be with him, you are going to have the old man still with you that's been conquered by the cross, but he is still with you. And that is to push you to Jesus all the time. You're going to struggle with unbelief. You're going to struggle with doubt. You're going to struggle with worry. You're going to struggle with, I don't think I can get out of bed today. You're going to struggle with your future husband or wife or your present husband and wife. You're going to have conflict in your family. You're going to have problems with your neighbors. And what Jesus is saying is the gospel is all about coming to me with those needs and saying, I don't have what it takes. <laughs> I need the living bread. I need the Lord Jesus to fill me. I am hungry today. I am tempted today. In this moment, Jesus, would you fill me with yourself? Would I see your glory? Would I come to your banquet and be filled? I was just at a wedding. Uh, one of the, my former students got married up in New Hampshire, and I had the opportunity to do their wedding. And it was a wonderful celebration, and I loved the uh, reception afterwards. It didn't have just one cake. They had several different cakes there. You know, it was a chocolate cake. I think there was like vanilla cake. And, but not just that, there was pies. They loved pies. And they said, we, we want to do this wedding where the things, the foods that we like to eat, we're going to have at the wedding. So it wasn't your standard wedding. Like, 
They had bread pudding. They had all these different types of pies. They had this barrel with like sodas, like fancy sodas, like Jones and like IBC root beers. And like they said, everything we like to eat, we want to have at our wedding. They had um, sliders at their wedding, like the little burgers, you know. They had salmon fillets. They had like some sort of like chicken and blue. I mean, it was a feast. I mean, and that's, you know, that's what weddings are. They're a picture. They're ultimately a picture of the ultimate wedding feast. What are we going to do when we get to heaven? We're not going to starve. Jesus is inviting us to feast, okay, to that amazing wedding feast of the Lamb, okay? It says in Isaiah that we're going to have the, the, the choicest meats and, and the finest wines that we are going to celebrate with our Savior and be blessed by Him. And so when you think about church, and this is why church is so important, why the worship of the, of the people of God on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, is so important. Because this is, this is one big feast during the week. This is, this is the one big feast during the week. Now, all week you're feasting. All week you're grazing on the gospel. You're going to prayer meetings. You're going to youth group. You're going to Bible study. These sorts of things. You're, you're, you're seeking the Lord. But then this is a really important time because this is where you're being fed God's word. And then um, every few weeks, you're going to have the Lord's Supper, which again is another place where, you're say, where you say, I need Jesus in this meal, in the worship, in the singing of the songs, I meet him. In the prayers, I meet him. In the reading of the scriptures, I meet him. In the Lord's Supper, you meet him. And Jesus is feeding his people. A lot of people think, oh, church is just another thing I do. I have to go to church to get God's blessing. We got it backwards. Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, like we read in Isaiah, you know, come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. He's saying, I've come to give myself to you. Receive me. Fill yourself with me. I'm here to serve. I'm here to bless. So church is not, hey, I'm going to go to church so that maybe God can bless me. It's like, church is the blessing. Jesus, look what Jesus has done for me, the sinner. He's given himself to me. So, how do you think about your faith? Is it a one-time event? Was it way back then? Or do you see... That the gospel is coming to Jesus and being fed with Jesus is really a constant in your life. The evidence of a true faith, the evidence that that one time thing that happened is real, is that you continue to go back. You continue to see yourself as a bigger sinner than you thought you were. And the last thing is this. True faith is reliance on Jesus and his work alone, not on yourself. True faith is a reliance on Jesus alone, not the works of the law. Because the crowd, again, was confused in verse 28. As Jesus begins to talk to them about the living bread, he said, they say to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Okay, they are automatically thinking, there's got to be something we do. We, let's do the works of God. And Jesus says in 27, do not labor for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. What he's saying is that true faith receives the gospel as a gift. Do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. He will give it. It's a gift. They were thinking the law of God is doable. What can we do, Jesus, to be doing the works of God? And Jesus is saying, guess what? You can't do anything because I have done it for you. I'm going to do it for you. I'm heading to the cross to do the work of redemption. Dying for sinners in your place. 
taking all the justice of God for you, rising from the dead, an affirmation from God that the sacrifice was accepted. The finished work of Jesus on the cross. And so, true faith rests in God's work. In verse 29, Jesus puts it like this, the work of God. Okay, you guys want to talk about work? The work of God is that you believe in Him who has sent you. And this is kind of um, counterintuitive. The work of God is to believe. Belief is not a work. Belief is a resting. Belief in Jesus is a trust. I heard an analogy like this. It's kind of like a wire. You electrical engineers in here, think about this. A power source, okay? And a wire resting upon it. Is the wire doing anything? No, it's just receiving the current, okay? To go from point A to point B. It's receiving, it's resting. That faith is like that. Faith is a resting. Faith is a trust in Jesus. Resting on his finished work, what he has done for us. They are saying, what must we do? And Jesus says, well, the work of God, the work of God, it's God's work. It's what I did on the cross, the work of God, is that you believe in him who has sent me. And so what Jesus is actually even saying here is that I'm the one giving you the faith to believe. We only have to look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, not of yourselves. It's the work of God, lest any man should boast. Jesus is saying that even our faith to believe in Him is a gift. Trusting in Jesus alone is the work of God. Again, if you would ask most people in our culture, well, what's, what's uh, church all about? What's Christianity all, all about? Well, that's a... It's a code of ethic. Those people like uh, are trying to live by the Ten Commandments, and they're doing good things, and they're you know trying to love their neighbors. And if they do all these things, then God will bless them and bring them to heaven. I mean, that's what most Americans think. That when they think Christianity, they think it's about what you do in order to get God to do something for you. But again, that's opposite, and it's opposite of what the true gospel is and what Christianity really is. The message of Christianity is not primarily we're doing all these things. The message of Christianity is that God and the Lord Jesus Christ did what we couldn't do for ourselves. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live and he died the death that we deserved on the cross. It's the work of Jesus which gives salvation. And so Jesus says the opposite of what they're thinking. He says in verse 32, My Father gives you the true bread from heaven, coming down. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus in verse 38, I came to do the will of Him who sent me. Jesus is coming down. Religion is going up. It's trying to go up. I mean, that's the big difference between Christianity and all the world religions. All the world religions of the world, this is always something I think about. How do we know if Christianity is true? One of the reasons I believe it's true is because it's so opposite of the way people normally think. You know, if you think about some of the world religions, it's all about a series of steps in order to, you know, reach nirvana or um, the five pillars of Islam. If you do these things, then Allah will bless you. Okay? It's all about what you can do, kind of climbing this ladder. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christianity, is totally 180 degrees different. Is saying, no, it's not what, what you did climbing up, because you couldn't climb up, you didn't want to. You're actually running in the opposite direction. Getting what, you wanted to get away from God. You wanted to be God. And Jesus runs after you, comes down for you, 180 degrees different. And so that's why Jesus even says in this passage, he begins talking about these ideas of election and predestination. Okay, if you haven't studied those, look, think about this passage, John 6. John 6 is hard to get away from um, predestination. It's hard to get away from 
election and being chosen by God. Look, look at what he says in 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me. It's like there's this elect, this number. 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus, you know, this is getting deep here. He's saying that there's this, there's this body of elect out there, the church before the foundation of the earth. Now this is mysterious. This doesn't say we don't uh, do the work of evangelism. But God is saying something, and Jesus is saying something very important. He's saying that even your salvation, even your faith is a gift from God. Why? So God gets all the glory. It's nothing uh, from us. It's nothing about... Chris, is, Chris finally figured it out. He finally came to faith. Woo! No. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they're drawing, they're calling, they're giving you the faith to believe. So the Hunger Games is about what God has done and filling us in Jesus Christ. And this, this knocks the legs out of pride. It knocks the legs out of, this is about me. Jesus is feeding us with Himself and who He is. And so, I ask you today, what are your motives? Why are you here? Is it to be fed? Is it to repent and recognize that yes I am a sinner I'm looking in all the wrong places and Jesus is the one giving me this deeper gift Jesus is the one giving me hope ultimate hope Jesus is, is the one blessing me with every spiritual blessing in Christ it's not about me it's not about the temporal and you know what he says in, in Matthew he says seek first my kingdom and all these things will be given unto you. And he's talking about those temporal things. He's saying, if you seek me, if you seek my kingdom, he loves his children. He's going to be with you. He's going to help you. He's going to give you your daily bread. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for this time to look at your word, to think about this gospel, this glorious gospel of grace that Jesus is giving Lord, would we receive it? Would you instill in our hearts a desire to come to you again and again and again, Lord, recognizing that we are big sinners, but you are an amazing, great Savior. Would you fill us? Would you bless us? In Jesus' name, amen.